Let's start off with the appreciation of the renminbi. It's obviously heated debate. It's something Lumkile and I touched on a little earlier. But the point is that we know that they are, they are getting quite a lot of pressure from the U.S. to try and get a free, a free floated currency. Do you think that is likely at this stage of the game? I think a fully free-floating currency at the moment is unlikely. Mm -hmm. um, in the medium to long term, it's definitely in China's own interest to move towards a uh, revaluation of the currency, um, part particularly in light of its next five-year, uh, its 12th five-year um, plan, where it's looking to unlock greater domestic demand and the appreciation of the renminbi will um, definitely work positively towards unlocking greater domestic demand. Well, unlocking greater domestic demand, but exports is what the Chinese government is, is talking about. And we know that they, they logged a deficit for the month of March, $7.24 billion. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting because it comes in the wake of all this debate that is occurring between the U.S. and China. Do you think that they could perhaps use that as an excuse to not allow their currency to appreciate in what many say perhaps 2% each month? If we look back, um, the currency has appreciated over since 2005 about 18%, and it's going to be a gradual appreciation. I think what's important is to know the interaction and the mutual relationship between the U.S. and the China in terms of China actually supporting low interest rates in the U.S., China's um, buying up debt in U.S. Treasury bills um, of the U.S. So a move out of U.S. dollars in terms of foreign exchange reserves, for example, or a, a quite a dramatic change in terms of moving from a trade surplus in China to, to potentially a deficit um, might have particularly bad consequences for the US. Mm. Lumkila, your view on the yuan that of course is pegged to the US dollar, and I think it's been pegged to the US dollar since August 2008. Well, I mean, Hannah has put it very clearly that mm. everything that China does is in China's interest. And they've learned from their masters, the Americans, because the Americans exactly drive the, the same agenda. Um, this is the frustration that we've been having uh, in multilateral discussion around uh, food uh, subsidies. Uh, and therefore, the Chinese are doing it correctly, um, and they'll have to open up at some stage. However, the biggest challenge of, cr of creating a, a, a very strong dem domestic demand is the high saving rate, uh, rate of Chinese. Chinese are just strong savers. They don't go out and buy uh, and buy and consume as other consumers in developed and some emerging markets do. So therefore, it remains uh, when they do devalue the currency, whether the consumer will come to the party given their high savings rate uh, in comparative terms. While the crisis occurred uh, it, you know, globally as well, Hannah, there was a lot of talk about getting an alternative to the US dollar and it also became quite a heated debate and it seems that Brazil, Russia, India and China are quite keen to create a new currency and not so much a brand new currency but a new weighted currency that will include the euro, the dollar, the yen and various other currencies as well. Your view on this, and do you think that the BRIC countries can in fact create this currency and that it will be used in global trade? I think what's important is that this debate around the reserve currency um, being the US dollar has been around for, for many, many years. Um, over the last decade, it, it emerged again. I think the crisis was a cherry on top. Um, there's been a lot of discussions around potentially work, uh, moving towards a weighted um, currency basket in line with special drawing rights of the IMF as well. The whole idea of the bank call came up again in terms of fixing currencies to commodities, actually um, 30 or so commodities, including gold. And that's actually nothing new. That came about 60 plus years ago mm -hmm. and was um, an excellent idea proposed by John Maynard Keynes. And maybe it's time that we have a, a revision of the way the international financial system functions and operates, especially because there's a net deflationary bias in the system at the moment, meaning that the US is able to run the large deficits that it is running. And there's no pressure on China from a current account um, and payment of balance perspective to actually decrease its surplus. Yet other countries that are running um, current account deficits, particularly in Africa, the likes of South Africa, for example, we have huge pressure then on our currency to, um, to attract um, um, investment in order to, um, it, through, through higher interest rates. And that's a big problem in terms of unlocking demand again and stimulating growth in these economies. Nukila, your view on this, and do you think that we'll, we'll be seeing a new currency sometime soon? Well, well, no, I don't think so. I don't think, I don't think in the near future you're not going to see it. I think the debate for us in the global economy, which is very frustrating, is around globalization. That once we've agreed to go uh, to go the global route, then it means that people must remove any support that they provide to companies, to sectors. I think by doing that, 
then we start the reallocation that Hannah is talking about of capital moving apart. Because theoretically, what Keynes was talking about and people before him, Adam Smith, they're talking about a free flow of goods and services. And in this juncture, we know that there's lots of manipulation. Therefore, the balancing of, of, of countries that having deficit or surpluses, balancing off and making sure that the stability, the global financial system is undermined by intervention. Uh, so we need a lot of talk. We need a lot of honesty by developed countries. And if they, they come to the table, they open up because most of us have opened up. And South Africa is running a free floating currency and and it's very, very difficult for us to make any further concession now because we've opened up and other countries aren't doing the same because they're more powerful than us. So therefore, I think for us, let's play the material game fairly, let these countries open up and the Chinese will also have to respond. Hannah, when you look at the BRIC countries, uh, many say that the power in is increasing between uh, Brazil, Russia, India, China and other emerging markets. Uh, what role do you think the BRIC, BRIC countries will have uh, in the world global economy? Um, I think what's really uh, um, fascinating in the sense mm -hmm. that when the whole term of the BRICS was termed, that um, Jim O'Neill from Goldman Sachs, I don't think, was thinking that these countries was actually um, create a forum on its own and come together to discuss, I discuss issues in the global economy. But I think what we're going to be seeing is, given the great population in these countries, um, the structural transformation, industrialization processes um, in these countries, they're absolutely going to be playing a greater role um, in the global economy. They contributed about 40% to GDP growth over the last few years. This is going to increase um, to about two thirds or so of GDP world GDP growth. And I think um, in light of that, they're going to um, play increasingly an important role in the economic, the global financial, but also political system.